All right, morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to OpenStack Summit. Uh, so I want to apologize in advance. I actually had a small mishap with my laptop last night. It has served me well for two and a half years uh, and chose to die on me. So I'm actually up here with no slides. I've got some notes I wrote down. Um, so bear with me if uh, this might be a little bit shorter than planned, uh, and I might tend to ramble a little bit, so uh, hopefully not. So a uh, brief introduction. So my name is Russell Hayring. I work at Rackspace. Um, Rackspace, as I'm sure most of you are aware, is a hosting company. So what most of you are probably familiar with us for is uh, our OpenStack-based public cloud. So the largest OpenStack-based public cloud in the world. You probably saw Troy's keynote. Um, but it turns out that we've been doing that. We launched that in 2012. Um, in 2008, we acquired SliceHost. So we're doing kind of VPS uh, hosting. We've been in the cloud business for around six years now. Um, but prior to that, actually since the late 90s, a lot of our business has been dedicated hosting. Um, and so the way dedicated hosting works is that you're you know, a computer user, you need some computers, and so you call up Rackspace, and you speak to a, a Rackspace employee on the phone to help you design kind of an infrastructure to meet your needs. Um, and then some guys go out in the data center, they put servers in, they plug them in, they turn them on, uh, we put an operating system on there for you, and then we'll kind of manage it for you on an ongoing basis. Um, and over 16 years, we've built up a lot of servers, and we've built up a lot of tooling around that. Um, so you know, as you might imagine at first, it's like a guy goes out and puts a CD in there, boots up you know, Red Hat, installs it on there. Um, over time, we, we develop automation around this. Um, it turns out there's actually lots of servers in the world. So estimates suggest there's between 50 and 100 million servers running in the world right now. Uh, and it's only a very, very small percentage of those are at Rackspace. So we're not the only ones with this tooling. Right? Anyone with servers is building tooling for provisioning servers. It just makes sense. Uh, and there's lots of tooling. So there's open source tooling, there's proprietary tooling, and there's a lot of kind of just do-it-yourself tooling. It turns out that putting code onto a server isn't in the end all that difficult. Um, so if you're Google, it just like it only makes sense to build your own tooling, right? Um, but when you think about it, kind of like all this tooling being built by all these different people, it doesn't really make sense. And so about six months ago, we set out to sort of rethink, you know, how can we make our tooling better? What we quickly realized is we're doing this dedicated stuff, we're doing this cloud stuff, how can we use OpenStack to make better tooling for dedicated hosting? Uh, and so we kind of went off on our own for a couple months, we were building some stuff, um, and at the end of those three months, we realized there's this OpenStack project, Ironic, uh, and it makes a lot of sense for us to use it. So since then, we've been kind of working on Ironic. Um, now, I want to share kind of a dream I have with you. So uh, you probably saw in the keynote this morning some mention of you know, the, the global cloud, the software-defined data center. I want to talk about the software-defined data center. So this is the idea that you know, today we're using cloud. I can call up, I can get a virtual machine via an API. Um, th the fundamental thing that's happening there is we're using virtualization to dice up individual computers. And we can achieve much, much higher efficiency by handing out like, slices of computers to whoever needs a slice of a computer. Right? But we're only doing that at the level of individual computers today. So we want to get to this point where we have a whole data center, you know, rows, just rows and rows of computers. Uh, and anyone who needs a computer can call up and can get that computer on demand. Right? And so maybe you want, maybe you want a generic computer that just you know, runs code. That's what we think of like the server. Right? Uh, maybe you want some storage. Maybe you want a switch. Uh, maybe you want a load balancer. These are all just types of computers. And so the dream is of having this data center just full of different kinds of computers, generic computers, specialized computers, and you can provision all of it via an API. Uh, to make this happen, we need software-defined networking to get good and real. Uh, we need better provisioning on servers. There's a lot of things that we need to do between now and then, but the dream is just of this, this data center that's all driven via an API. Um, and we want that API to be part of OpenStack. So um, the idea here is that we want to take Ironic and basically drive it in that direction. And so when we first started looking at Ironic around three months ago, what we discovered is that there were really two fundamental limitations of Ironic, um, and none of them are, maybe fundamental is the wrong word. They're limitations of Ironic that existed three months ago, and our goal is to eliminate them. So the first of these limitations is that it doesn't integrate at the network layer. Ironic is all about putting code onto servers. Um, and if you actually look back, like so at one point OpenStack Bare Metal, for example, was able to uh, configure switches on the fly. We want to get there. So what we've been doing since then, we have a team of four developers at Rackspace. 
Um, what we've been doing since then is working on uh, modifying Ironic so that it can control these switches. So the idea is that a customer calls up and they can uh, you know, provision a server and we will configure that switch on the fly, put the server on whatever VLANs they want, just on the fly. Um, and the second limitation is around how provisioning works. So Ironic, it actually has a really great design around uh, this concept of interfaces. So there's a power management interface. There's what's called a management interface, which you can use to modify how a server boots. Uh, but the really critical interface is the deployment interface. So the deployment interface is where kind of the magic happens. Um, that's what puts code onto a server and makes it run. So today, if you deploy Ironic as it exists in OpenStack today, uh, what will happen when you boot a server is that the server will be powered on using the power interface. Uh, it'll be told to pixie boot, and it will pixie boot a, uh, what they call a, a RAM disk agent. And so this agent will connect up to Ironic, say, hey, I'm here, give me some code. Uh, and then it exports a, an iSCSI target. Um, and so Ironic will mount that target uh, and then write out an image to the volume uh, and then reboot and you're good to go. Now, there are really two problems there. One is that we don't feel that it scales because Ironic itself has to do a lot of work. It's constantly mounting volumes, writing out code. Um, and the other problem is that it doesn't give us the flexibility to do the things we need. So like I mentioned, in order for this vision of the software-defined data center to become true, uh, what we need is we need for the ability to do multi-tenancy. And multi-tenancy requires more than just putting code on computers. Um, so an example of this is obviously secure wiping disks. When a customer is done with a computer, we need to be able to securely wipe their disks. And today we have tooling for that. And we're trying to think, how can we modify Ironic to do that for us? And we can't do that via iSCSI. You know, there's things you can do, but it's not pretty. Um, and so uh, this has sort of led us to a new model. So, what we've been doing is we've been taking the code we were writing before we were working on Ironic and modifying it. It's become what's called the Ironic Python agent. Uh, so it's now a part of OpenStack. Um, and the idea here is that instead of booting this kind of simple RAM disk, we boot a slightly more uh, intelligent RAM disk, which runs an agent that has a REST API. And so this REST API allows Ironic to do interesting things, like make a call to the API that says, secure erase your disks, and the server will just go ahead and do that. Um, it can also make a call to the API that says download you know, image XYZ and write it out on disk. And the agent can do that. So the agent will actually connect up to Glance, uh, or in our case we're using Swift as a Glance image backend. It can connect up there, download the image, and then write that out. Um, and the final kind of interesting thing the agent can do is it can write out a config drive partition. So uh, who here is familiar with config drive? So config drive is a mechanism that OpenStack, specifically Nova, uses uh, to put user-specific information onto an instance when a customer creates it. So uh, for example, if I want to boot a web server, I can inject some JSON in there and I can say, you know, uh, roles equals web. And then when the server boots up, I can have code in the server that introspects that JSON, pulls out the roles of the server, and then causes that server to become a web server. It kind of tells the server what its identity is and any other metadata that it might need to know about itself. Um, and so uh, what we can do by injecting this config drive partition is actually uh, make a bare metal server look more like a cloud server. Um, and so this is, again, sort of another step towards that dream of the software-defined data center, right? Um, so what I want from people here, so today there are effectively five of us plus the Ironic community. We've gotten a lot of great support from the Ironic community, but the Ironic community itself is small, so we want more help. Um, so I, what I want from people here is I want you to uh, check it out. Come, you know, go check out Ironic, check out the Ironic Python agent, check out the changes that we have open to make this, this dream a reality, um, and then contribute. So again, there's four developers here. How many, who here writes code? Yeah, so that's a lot more than four. Uh, we can have hundreds of you all writing code, making this software-defined software data center a reality. Um, and that's a big deal, right? You know, how, how much can we accelerate when we go from four developers to 200? Uh, and then I want you to tell your friends. So here are his friends. Wow, um, that's kind of sad. So I, I'm suspecting that more of you have friends. Uh, and of your friends, probably some of your friends write code. So we can have literally thousands of developers that we can network with right here and have everyone contributing to Ironic. 
right? So we can build the software-defined data center. Now, a lot of you think I'm crazy, right? Because I'm up here like talking about this thing that you probably haven't heard that much about. Uh, like, who cares? We're working on OpenStack. Uh, OpenStack runs on servers. So it's kind of a fundamental thing that we're thinking, you know, the cloud is the future of the cloud. Uh, but what does the cloud run on? It runs on servers. And we're focusing more on the software we're putting on the servers than we're gonna, how we're going to make the servers run that software. And fundamentally, OpenStack is just software. So this is why it's so important that Ironic succeed as part of OpenStack, is because Ironic is actually how, Ironic, or is how OpenStack is going to run on servers. Um, and so you can see this as the Triple O project, for example. It's a project to basically use Ironic to build out what they call the undercloud. And on that undercloud, you run the overcloud. And that's a really powerful idea, is that what OpenStack is about is exposing infrastructure. And then that infrastructure can be used to expose infrastructure at different levels of granularity. But we shouldn't be tied to this idea that you know, a cloud is a virtual machine. A cloud is infrastructure. So, if, so I live in San Francisco. Uh, if you go to the Bay Area and you find a late stage startup, what you're actually gonna find is that more and more they're not using the cloud. They might be using the cloud as a, a way of getting infrastructure, but many of them aren't. Many of them have their own data centers. Uh, and when they are using the cloud or in their own data center, they're using different management priv primitives to sort of boot different kinds of servers. So uh, three years ago, what you would have found is that you would have found people are creating a web node over here, a database node over here, a cache node over here. Uh, this idea of like a server equates to a service is kind of dying. You're not gonna walk into Twitter and find them using virtual machines to like divide up a computer into web nodes and cache nodes. You're gonna find them using containers. Uh, and I don't want to make a bet on containers. I don't actually, I, I think containers are great. Um, but the point of this is that by having these, these well-defined levels of abstraction around infrastructure, we don't have to make a bet. We make a bet on servers because we know that containers are going to run on servers. Uh, we make a bet on servers because we know that virtual machines run on servers. But whatever the future holds, it probably holds code running on servers. Um, and so this idea that like bare metal is dead is wrong. Right? Dedicated servers uh, are, are the past and the future because they're just how, you know, it's how they are computers. Um, so the other part of this is that why are people actually using, say, like a virtual machine? And it's really, there's two things. There's, like I mentioned, there's this idea of uh, different, you know, management abstractions, the, you know, the web node and the cache node. Uh, the other reason is that they want to purchase infrastructure in smaller increments. Uh, why buy a whole server when you only need half of one? Um, and that makes sense for people who only need half of a server. But when you're, you know, Google is not buying half of a server to save money, right? Google, you know, they're rolling in thousands of servers a day. Uh, and so as you sort of scale, as the, the you know, the web scales, uh, people are buying servers in larger increments. And so worrying more, like the amount of engineering that has gone into building virtualization technology is really incredible. Uh, and all of that engineering is fundamentally going into enabling people to buy things in smaller increments, and that's great. Um, but like, what if we put that much engineering into allowing people to buy, you know, software-defined data centers? So I keep kind of coming back to that idea of the software-defined data center, because again, it's really the dream. Um, but it's a ways out. So what we want to do uh, is by the Juno Summit, we want to get the Ironic Python agent uh, and its associated deployment driver into Ironic. Uh, and again, for that to happen, we need your help. Um, we need to make changes to Neutron. So we're using Neutron to control switches. Uh, we're using Neutron in actually a terrible way. Uh, I hope we can improve upon that. And Neutron itself has some issues, right? Um, and so we need your help to make Neutron better. We have one guy working on Neutron today. Um, and we're not gonna build a software-defined data center with one guy working on Neutron. Um, so by Juno, we wanna have Neutron better. We wanna have the Ironic Python agent and its associated driver merged. We wanna have Ironic able to use these improvements to Neutron to actually drive better control of the networks. Longer term, we can take advantage of software-defined networking, uh, begin uh, enabling more, more dynamic use cases, you know, grabbing a switch over here, an F5 over here and some servers over here. Um, but again, that's a ways out. So, um, but even if we can get this into Juno, we will, by the end of the year, be able to sort of enable these use cases around, if I want to deploy a cloud on the cloud, that's easily doable. 
uh, I just call up, I get some servers, I put a cloud onto those servers, and then I, I have ways of dicing up that infrastructure if I believe in that, that virtual machine as a management abstraction. If I want to install Mesos or Docker onto those servers, I can do that too. Um, and so that way, we can, you know, we can run triple O, Twitter can run their thing, I mean, they're probably not gonna use my software, but maybe they will. Um, and so it sort of enables all this choice. You can do whatever you want, because when you can get computers, you have this, this infrastructure abstraction, uh, you, can, you can do whatever you want. You can use computers the way you've been used to using them, but you don't have to worry about, you know, like a crash card in a data center uh, or pixie booting. You just make a call to an API and you get back a computer. Uh, and that's kind of the dream. So, again, sorry this was kind of a little bit briefer than I had intended. Uh, who has questions? Yes. I uh, haven't had a chance to play with it as of right now, but can you speak to the, the state of, of Prime Universe, specifically when it comes to like marketing the DHCP agents, being able to, to keep the ecosystem in place without having to have a dedicated social media network and roll it over later? Like, what specifically do you need? So specifically on Ironic. Yes, so the question is about how can, uh, or what is the state of Neutron in Icehouse as it relates to Ironic? Um, so Ironic today doesn't actually use Neutron for much. Um, it uses Neutron for one thing in particular, which is controlling DHCP, and that's very important for the Ironic use case because uh, in order to pixie boot a server, you need to be able to control DHCP, uh, or that's sort of the, the assumption that it's built on. That's really the only thing that it's used for today. Uh, that's not actually how we are intending to run Ironic, so I don't know that much about how functional it is. Uh, we looked a little bit at, Iron or at Neutron. We're, we're not super impressed, so it uses DNS mask for its, its DHCP agent, and we were not blown away by that. Uh, so uh, the Rackspace Cloud doesn't actually uh, support DHCP today, um, and so that was sort of the model we were looking at, is like if, if the Rackspace Cloud can't run DHCP, can we? And I think the answer is obviously this can be improved upon, but today uh, it's just not a problem that I wanted to solve. Uh, in the future, the idea is actually that instead of Ironic itself talking so much to Neutron, it's really about having the Vert driver and Nova talk to Neutron so that we can maintain these levels of abstraction around creating what seem to be virtual ports, and then later Ironic associates those virtual ports with a physical switch. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yes. And so that's actually, that's our objective is that we can use Neutron to effectively move servers between our dedicated provisioning network, uh, which will be kind of an isolated network that uh, we use to pixie boot the server, to talk to the agent across. Uh, and then later when we put the customer code on there, we will move that server to customer facing networks. Okay, so it's still a, you know, like a boundary network that you have to relocate between the world. Yeah, yeah, completely automatic, but that is sort of the, what's happening behind the scenes. Over here. Yeah, good question. So the question is, uh, how much work are we doing to abstract away Pixie so that we can do sort of other bootstrap, bootstrapping mechanisms? So um, Ironic supports, again, that kind of deployment interface, and they have what they call today the Pixie deploy driver. And that's not really actually that specific to Pixie. It uses Pixie as a mechanism for exporting iSCSI targets. But if you, can, if you have another thing that does kind of the same thing as Pixie, it's fairly well abstracted, so you can easily replace that. Our goal with the, uh, the, with the Ironic Python agent is actually to get away from sort of these, these old technologies, what we view as old technologies like Pixie, and get into things like HTTP as quickly as possible. So what we're actually doing is we're uh, Pixie booting uh, iPixie and then using iPixie so we can actually like download like a real image from Swift uh, and run that. But again, the idea is sort of to bootstrap out of old and into new as quickly as possible. And to the user, it should never be visible that we're using Pixie or uh, even a dedicated server behind the scenes. Anything over here? Yeah. Good question. So the question is, how are we validating firmware after a tenant releases a machine? And this is actually, I think, one of the biggest challenges with uh, trying to run Ironic in a multi-tenant fashion. So the answer is basically firmware signing. So instead of trying to validate the firmware, we're using signing to try to prevent customers from, from manipulating that. So in our dedicated business today, we're already sort of 
recycling servers. What's changing with Ironic is that we could potentially, if we're able to deploy it, recycle servers more quickly. Um, and so uh, we believe that firmware signing is critical. We would like to see it get better. So this is actually, I think, one of the, one of the maybe like two year kind of challenges is that hardware is frankly terrible. Firmware is terrible. The way that signing works is terrible. Pixie booting itself is terrible. Uh, so we want to fix that, but to fix that, we, I think, need to be bigger, right? Uh, and so by, so, I mean, so you contribute to Ironic. So for example, there's a, a C-Micro driver that uses kind of interesting C-Micro hardware. We would love to see others sort of trying to build interesting hardware that uh, integrates with the, this idea of the software-defined data center. So the C-Micro thing, it's a box of computers. It exposes a REST API. It's like a little mini software-defined data center. So I'd love to see hardware move in that direction, but another part of that is gonna be that if we want this, this virtual data center, we need better security. Uh, and so, it's an iterative process. Back there. Right, so the question is, uh, so I mentioned that we can erase disks um, using the ironic Python agent, and the question is, is there an intention to be able to manage firmware as well? And the answer is yes, absolutely. So uh, first of all, we consider that sort of a core functionality that must exist. If ironic is going to be successfully multi-tenanted, we must be able to securely upgrade and manage firmwares. Um, but more generically, there are many things that might happen on a host that we can't, I can't stand up here and anticipate what kind of hardware you might decide to put into a server tomorrow. And so the idea of the Ironic Python agent is that it's actually extensible so that you can sort of discover hardware in your machine and then manage it however you think it needs to be managed. Uh, so if firmware upgrades are necessary, and they probably are, uh, you can do those, and that's sort of a core functionality. But if you have you know, a Bitcoin mining ASIC in there, and if you need to reset that, for example, between customers, uh, you could extend the Ironic Python agent to do that as well. Back there. So the question is if we're working with hardware vendors to tie into their lifecycle controller. So uh, at Rackspace, we work with many hardware vendors, but more specifically in the, uh, in the Ironic com community. So actually HP is one of the largest contributors to Ironic. Uh, C-Micro, again, was working on their kind of C-Micro driver. So one of the visions of Ironic is actually this idea of like vendors contributing code that works with their hardware. And I actually think that's really powerful because it means that we can get things like these really cool C-Micro boxes. And it enables hardware vendors to innovate more quickly because they can expose this functionality to customers. Like if you're running Ironic, if you just roll one of these things in and plug it in, suddenly that functionality is exposed instead of you having to figure out how to work the REST API. So I think that's really powerful. Yeah? Right, so the, the idea here is that you might build, the same way that you build an image for a virtual machine, uh, you could build an image for a bare metal server, and obviously there are some differences. Um, for example, one of the things that we've been discussing uh, is how do we support hardware versus software RAID and things like that. But fundamentally what we wanna get towards is this idea that images are images, and those images might run on a virtual machine or they might run on bare metal. Um, and so whatever tools you can use to build an image today, uh, for a virtual machine, you should be able to use to build an image that runs on bare metal hardware. Yeah? Yes, yes, absolutely. So the agent today speaks HTTP and you can point it at any URL. So if you can put an image on HTTP, it can grab it. If you want to extend the agent to do more, to speak other protocols or to do interesting things with images or you know, some other data once it has them to provision the server somehow, uh, that kind of makes sense to me. Over here. So a question on the Utah connection. Yeah. So that is how Ironic works today, um, is you, know, you have servers and Ironic kind of manages the servers, but it doesn't really touch the switches. 
Uh, and that makes a lot of sense in the kind of triple O use case, right? Because you effectively have one trusted user uh, that's going to install OpenStack on the, the under cloud and then expose that OpenStack to other users. Um, in that use case, it makes sense. If we want to have multiple users using this, most users are gonna want some sort of network isolation, or at least we wanna be able to move servers between the sort of provisioning network and then the, the user-facing network, even in like a triple O world. We don't want triple O on the provisioning network, right, like once the, the under cloud is running. Um, so I think that it's critical that we be able to manage the network, uh, at least for the, both for the multi-tenant use case and for the way that the Python agent works. Um, in a very trusted scenario, I guess in theory you don't have to do that. Over here? Yeah. Yes, so that was actually the intention uh, for the Ice House release. Um, unfortunately, there were sort of two things that blocked it. Um, one is that there needs to be a migration path for users of uh, the bare metal project today. Um, and the other is that we need better uh, continuous integration so that we can test Ironic in order to actually be uh, land the vert driver into Nova. Um, Right, did that answer your question? So he's the PTL, so. <laughs> Over here? So for just getting back to the time frame, you, you were talking about using the standard you know, plugin technology and this and that and stuff uh, in, in between. Uh, right, so what we've done is we've actually developed our own thing. Um, and I'm not very proud of it. So I think what we need to do is we need to sort of go back to the drawing board and figure out uh, should we be using ML2? Uh, the way our thing works is I guess vaguely similar to ML2, um, but it's a lot simpler. Um, and ML2 didn't actually solve the problems that we had, so we kind of went off and built our own thing. Uh, the way that any plugin to Neutron works, in my mind, isn't that pretty and kind of needs to be reworked a little bit, um, but I think ML2 is clearly a step in the right direction. Right, and that's certainly critical because you want to be able to have you know, different kinds of network equipment or even you know, different kinds of controllers, so uh, it's certainly critical. Yeah. Um, can you elaborate a little? Right, right, so uh, what we've done today is it just, it's uh, uh, the plugin that we've written for Neutron is specifically targets uh, like NXOS, so we run, we just basically SSH in and run commands. Uh, uh, this is sort of another area where, like I mentioned, hardware is terrible. Switches are basically in the same boat, um, and they're getting a little bit better. People are trying to expose REST API, Cisco has some kind of Python client, uh, maybe in theory. Uh, again, hardware is terrible. So. We would love to make that pluggable because we recognize that obviously in the near future there's not gonna be a standard interface for configuring switches. I mean, the other thing is that as we look forward, there's going to be like SDN controllers that we need to use to accomplish sort of the same use case. So it certainly needs to be pluggable. Today it's not. Right, and that's one of the reasons, that's what kind of ML2 does is it, it abstracts that away a little bit and we'd like to sort of leverage that to accomplish this. I think one last question. Right here. Right, so there are standards, uh, and again, <laughs> hardware is terrible and they're not good. 
um, and realistically hardware that claims to support those standards in many cases doesn't, and most hardware doesn't claim to support a standard at all. So what we've done sort of in recognition of that is that the, the Python agent abstracts that away a little bit, um, and so the idea is that you sort of say like, here's a firmware, uh, please flash it, um, and you can write code that detects your hardware and then flashes it in whatever way makes sense for that hardware. Um, there are real challenges there, like some hardware supports out of band firmware upgrades and that's the agent is kind of like explicitly in band, so the agent can't make a reasonable decision around that. Um, there's other, I'm sure there's things that the agent, uh, for example, some things require multiple reboots as part of the flash cycle and that's very difficult to keep track of state when the state is like on the machine that you're rebooting uh, and all in RAM. Uh, so there, there's work to be done there. We would love to see more standardization, but we recognize that in real life that's just not gonna happen, so. Exactly, yes, it's a driver model. One way in the back. Yes. Right, so the question is about uh, peripheral firmware. So there's not actually just one firmware on a server. There's firmware in the network card, there's firmware in the disks, there's firmware all over the place. Uh, and that's one of the real challenges again. So we think that the solution is signing, uh, and so that it happens today for some firmware, but the actual signing could be better. So that's another place that we would love to see some iteration from hardware manufacturers. Um, it's not impossible today, it's just not great. No, actually, I'm sorry, it's impossible. Okay. Peripheral firmware cannot be validated or out. It can't be validated, but it can be signed. But that, that can be completely fixed. Okay. Right, so uh, I will be around the summit all week. Uh, we're having a, a series of design sessions relating to this and just to Ironic in general. So stop by those design sessions if you're free. Uh, track me down, I'll be around. Um, and if you've got questions, uh, yeah, try to find me in the hallway after this. Thank you everybody.